Hey guys, I am out here for my once weekly very large pepper haul and I thought this would be a perfect time to go over the changes I want to make to the garden next year that I talked about in my previous video and just have a chat with you about what's been good this year, what's not been good, what I'm going to try again, what I'm not going to try again, etc, etc. While I pick loads of peppers. <laughs> Now at this point in the summer garden, I am just surviving. If any of y'all are gardeners, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's almost the end of the summer season. It's hot, the garden is full of weeds, the beds are full of weeds, and you're just very, very tired. <laughs> so I haven't been doing a whole bunch with these peppers in terms of like fermenting or I mean, I, I use them in fresh eating every day. But a lot of times I'm just so exhausted from all the preserving that I've been doing and all the picking and all the food that we're getting that I'm just dehydrating a bunch of them. Because what we do do is rehydrate them later and make sauces and stuff. So it's an easy form of hands-off preservation. I don't have to work very hard <laughs> to, to go through a ton of peppers at a time. But I am, I am feeling the end of the season for sure. So the first thing I definitely won't be doing next year is planting my corn in my in-ground garden. Uh, if you guys were with me when I talked about my corn harvest or the corn silk video, you'll know that I didn't get hardly any germination on those corn cobs because they were planted too far apart. And unfortunately in my in-ground garden, my rows are two to three feet apart from each other and I don't see a future where I'm going to get good pollination because I, you need to space corn. Within a square foot have two to three to four plants so that they can all get adequately poll pollinated. And I like my rows how they are, I like the spacing I have between my rows and it's just not going to work with the corn needing to be pollinated and I can't get those rows any closer together. So in the future, and I'm not exactly sure where right now, but I'm either gonna use the old bean plot that failed this year to grow just solely corn, or I'm gonna have to put it in one of my raised beds, which isn't the greatest because it takes up a lot of room for like tomatoes and peppers that I wanna have, but it's better than taking up feet of rows in the in-ground garden and not getting a single viable corn cob off of it. <laughs> it was fun though. It was fun to learn that I could grow it this year because I failed the past two years and that has not been fun. But I think the corn could survive in my area because we have several corn fields in our agricultural community. Of course, it's GMO corn and it's probably highly fertilized, but the main thing I'm worried about is it being in the direct sunlight during our desert heat. But since a lot of people grow corn fields around here, I think it'll be okay if I just find the right breed. <laughs> but speaking of putting my corn in the bean plot outside of my garden, away from my garden, I also do not want to grow several places at once this year. I have talked about this before. I tried to spread out my garden and grow as many places on this property that I could because I have an acre and a half to do so. Unfortunately, <laughs> it is extremely taxing on my mental and physical health to get out here in the heat of the spring and the summer and physically water by hand three different parts of the property every single day. And it really wore me out this year to the point where, you know how right now I talk about having <laughs> this, like every gardener does at the end of the summer season, just this exhaustion with the garden. But I ended up feeling that in July and I didn't like that at all. I didn't want to be done gardening in July. I don't ever want to feel like I'm done gardening, but I was so exhausted from doing that every day and just having that mental capacity to think about all these things that are failing in different spots and am I watering enough and poor soil. 
that I haven't built up. It's just, I do not want to do that again. So moving forward, at least into next year, I don't think I'm going to be trying to grow food in my front yard garden. That was, that was the most annoying because here in this garden, we are in the back of the house and the front yard is the complete opposite direction. I had to drag a hundred feet of hose every day to three different spots and it was just so tiring and it made me not enjoy it and I love enjoying the garden. I don't want to force myself in a situation where I'm not enjoying it anymore. And in order to make the whole process easier for myself, even if I don't plant food in the front yard garden next year, I have decided that I do want to put in a drip system because I have a ton of perennials up there. Um, like native medicinal perennial plants like vitex and desert willow that I am absolutely interested in keeping uh, but that still needs to be watered by hand at least once a week um, even more during the very very hot months when we're not getting any rain and even if I'm not dragging a hose up there trying to make several squash plants live I still have to make those perennials live so the drip system that I installed in this garden this year has been an absolute godsend and I can't believe I didn't do it sooner. And now that I realize how easy it is, I absolutely want to install a drip system for the perennials in the front yard garden. And hopefully once that happens, I mean, if I have constant water flowing, I mean, not constant water, but constant maintenance of those plants, they'll not only grow bigger better and faster, but it might help the wood mulch that I placed in my front yard garden decompose a little bit faster. That way I can have more nutrient rich soil in that front yard. Um, that front yard dirt is just fill dirt. My house is raised up a couple feet from the actual ground line because uh, we live in a flood zone. So all of that dirt in my front yard garden is just so, so terrible <laughs> fill dirt. And that's why I have such a problem growing things. Uh, I have to manually apply fertilizer to each plant wherever, but I can't just broadcast large amounts of fertilizer on the whole front yard garden. First off, it's all sand. At some point it will just run right through and out of that ecosystem. So I need to build it up with organic matter, which is what I'm doing with the wood chips. I just, they don't break down that fast when it's hot and dry. <laughs> you need water, uh, moisture to break down wood chips. And I'm not gonna set a sprinkler in my front yard to break down wood chips. It seems like a waste of water. So hopefully with the drip system up there, that'll take a lot of pressure off of me having to drag a hose every single day in the summer um, to water things. And then over time, it might just help improve the soil a little bit faster. In regards to pest pressure this year, I had an absolutely terrible time with tomato diseases, specifically curly top disease in tomatoes. And that's transmitted by a bug that you cannot really control um, because it's, it's carried on their saliva. So even if you were to spray your crops with something that would kill that specific bug, they have to bite the plant to ingest the poison and by that time they've already transmitted the disease. I've gone back and forth in my head of whether or not I want to like use row covers over my tomatoes to make sure that you know no bugs can get on them but over the course of this summer I had several plants fall prey to curly top even midway through the summer, which means there's not one specific time that this pest is coming through and that I can prevent them from eating it. They're coming through throughout the summer season, um, just sporadically at different times. And that means I would have to keep my tomatoes covered the entire season, and I'm not sure I wanna do that. Um, not just because that would be expensive for all the row covers I would need, uh, but it would be taxing. I would have to uncover the plants every day when I want to harvest, recover them back up, possibly get more and more row cover as these tomatoes grow because they get very tall, they keep growing throughout the season. And so it's not really something I'm interested in trying to prevent. I think it would be more work than it would be worth. And 
So I'll just keep doing the same thing I've always been doing, which is planting extra tomatoes, expecting to lose some. And then, you know, midway through the season, plant some seedlings, either start them from seed or buy them at the store and just start a new crop every time I lose some. I think that's, that's the best way that I can do it that doesn't give me a whole lot of stress and extra work in the garden. Uh, but it is, it is a problem and it is always disappointing just to see an entire tomato plant that's taken four months to get to mature size where it's growing tomatoes just die in a matter of a couple weeks because it got bit by a single bug. That really stinks. But that is something that is not preventable even if I wasn't an organic gardener, which I am. It wouldn't help. It wouldn't matter what I sprayed with the, on the crop because the bugs would still take a bite. <laughs> Another pest I've had a heck of a time dealing with this year are roly-polies. And I've dealt with them every year, but I lost so, so many seedlings that of course I started from seed, I worked hard to get them there, to just basic beheadings. Um, some of that was roly-polies, some of that were cutworms. And I had gone to you about the beheading problem and you guys came through awesomely in an amazing fashion as you usually do and let me know about cutworms because I'd never dealt with them before. And I had this thing that was working for a while where I would wrap aluminum foil around the base of the seedling and it would prevent cutworms from coming along and chopping their heads off. But unfortunately in my raised garden beds, I have so, so many roly polies and they I can't start hardly anything from seed in here. And when I do, I have to seed three times the normal amount just to get a few <laughs> to come to actual fruition while the other ones are kind of like sacrifice seedlings for the roly polies. I don't see my roly poly problem getting any better because I don't use anything to stop them. And honestly, I mean, they're not a terrible bug to have. What roly polies do, is break down organic plant matter. So all of this organic matter, like the straw and the dead leaves and stuff, they break down in your beds and they eat and they turn that into compost essentially in your garden beds. So I don't necessarily want them all to go away. There is a time and a place for every bug to exist and they have a purpose. But, I did find this organic pesticide that does kill roly polies and it's called Sluggo Max, I believe. Sluggo's the brand. And if I have this right, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's um, like a pelleted version of Spinosad. And Spinosad is an organic uh, pesticide. I actually have some just in a liquid version. But it does kill roly polies and slugs if you get the, the max version. I don't think the regular one kills roly polies, I'm not sure. I obviously don't have a problem with slugs because <laughs> it's really dry here, but I am definitely going to use Sluggo Max next year, at least in the very least where I am direct seeding my crops, like beans or, oh yeah, beans is really the only thing, peas. And then I, I honestly might have to use it this winter as well because I've got a direct seed. Uh, carrots, root vegetables, things like that. So that is one change I'm making because I normally do not use any sort of pesticide at all. I do have neem oil, but even neem oil, although it, it's recommended to be sprayed at night so that it doesn't affect pollinators, I have a beehive and I am well aware that my bees are still out foraging at night when I spray, when I would be spraying neem oil. So I'm not super interested in using a pesticide if I don't have to, uh, but I absolutely would rather have food than roly polies eating it all. <laughs> so that, that is one change I'm making because I am, I, I mostly don't use any sort of pesticide at all.
but I do use fertilizer um, in limited amounts. Usually it'll be when I first plant my seedlings, I'll throw some fertilizer in the hole and then maybe midway through the gardening season, I'll dust them over with another handful of some organic fertilizer. I change around which ones I buy. One of my favorites is gonna be Fox Farm, but really they're all good. Um, but this year in preparing for the fall garden, I actually went to Lowe's, no, it's Home Depot that has it here. Home Depot the other day and got my usual bags of soil because I have no ready compost and that stinks. So I am a no-till gardener, which means that I don't just turn over my soil every year. Oh, there's ants. <laughs> I don't just turn over my soil every year because I believe that it leads to a lot of microbial death and fungal death when those things are exposed to the air that shouldn't be. And honestly, I've been doing it since I started this garden and it works beautifully. You can tell in my oldest garden beds, they have the richest soil and the plants grow so well in them. But usually every season, whether it's spring or fall growing season, I, add a layer of compost on top of my beds, my own homegrown compost. And then that obviously is more nutrient dense than a bag of soil I can find at the store, but it also saves me money because I'm not having to use a bag of soil. I'm using compost that came from my own garden and plants and kitchen trash and all that stuff. But unfortunately this year, because I was so exhausted with the large garden, the three separate gardens, and it was just so dang hot this summer I did not maintain my compost pile very well. It was dry for most of the summer, and obviously it needs moisture to decompose things. So I don't have any compost ready for the fall garden this year. I, it'll probably be ready for next year's spring garden, but as of right now, I have no compost to use on these beds. So I have to go buy a ton of bags of soil uh, to top off all of these beds that I have. And that is expensive. <laughs> I think I, I mean, the, I get really cheap garden soil. They're about 10 bucks a bag, which is really good, but you can definitely tell how cheap it is. I was using it to start some seeds the other day and I opened up the bag and I was finding pieces of trash <laughs> in the soil. And I was like, oh no, this is disgusting. <laughs> um, but next year, I definitely want to take better care of my compost, even if it, if I'm not having to drag a hose to the front yard, <laughs> that'll be much easier to drag a hose to the compost pile at least once a week to keep that thing moist and keep it breaking down. Because as I continue to expand this garden, I am not going to be able to afford buying tons of bags of soil for all of these beds. Now let's move on to plants and which ones I am not going to be growing this year. Number one on the list is the Amish paste. My goodness, that tomato has been giving, just it's been miserable for two years for me. Every time it grows so well and so fast and I think I'm finally gonna get food off of it and then it just completely dies in the heat. Uh, if you recall back to my earlier garden tours this summer, the tomatoes were cooking on the vine. Every single one of them literally just cooked on the vine in, 100 degree weather and I can't have that because it's always 100 degrees or more here in the summertime. So I will be trying to find a different paste tomato to experiment with next summer. I did have one recommendation from a subscriber that said the San Marzano paste tomato works really well and she lives in my area. So I'll definitely give that one a try. I honestly have never tried any other paste tomatoes besides the Amish paste but it's always failed for me. So I don't know a lot of varieties. I'll have to do a lot of research, which is fine because I love seed shopping. <laughs> uh, but if you, if you guys have any suggestions, by all means, please leave it down below in the comments. I'm looking for specifically a paste tomato because otherwise I don't grow any other pastes and I want them to make sauce. Now it's totally doable to make sauce out of heirloom tomatoes or slicers or beef steaks but there's just a lot more juice. So you end up getting a lot less tomato 
out of the tomato for your sauce and just more seeds and juice and, and then I mean having more meat inside the tomato to make a sauce would be ideal. I have to take a little LaCroix break it's hot. Is it LaCroix? LaCroix? I don't know. This one's hibiscus flavored it's very very good but it is about noon. My fault <laughs> but I went to the gym this morning so this is usually when I get out into the garden is about midday because I like working out in the mornings. But it's, it's not too bad with the shade cloth and I don't think it's, it's in the low 90s right now. So it's not the hottest part of the day. But another thing I'm not gonna be growing is the chocolate pear tomato. So this is the chocolate pear tomato. Uh, at the beginning of the season, they were turning more brownish, which I suppose is where the name chocolate pear comes from. But that's not the reason I don't like it. I do not like the way that I don't like their flavor and they're very meaty. It's it's almost like if a cherry tomato was a paste tomato. And when I eat cherry tomatoes, like I said before, they're mostly for fresh eating for me. I don't like a ton of meat. I like the cherry tomatoes to like burst in my mouth with a bunch of sweet flavor and juiciness. And this is not that. I mean, and they're not very sweet. They're definitely a more tomatoey, robust flavor than a typical cherry tomato that would be sweet and fresh. Um, they're not bad, and they grew great. They they produced tons of tomatoes for me. I just didn't enjoy the flavor that much. And since I don't use cherry tomatoes for a whole bunch of anything besides fresh eating, I'd rather grow one that I enjoyed. <laughs> so I won't be growing the chocolate pear again. It was a free seed for me I think it was from seeds and such uh, and they sent like a pack of five seeds and a free seed so it was nice I mean I didn't spend a whole bunch of money to figure out I didn't like it I didn't spend any money <laughs> but yeah I will not be growing that cherry tomato again and I definitely want to expand my cherry tomato repertoire next year because as fun as the Mexico midgets are and they do really well in my area I would like something with a different color <laughs> something pretty and exciting like maybe a purple variety or a yellow variety so I will be looking into that for next year and just growing a bunch of different cherry tomatoes other than my tried and true which is the Mexico midget another plant that I do not want to grow next year is going to be the pepperoncini pepper and I know that sounds weird it's a very popular <laughs> very common pepper but I didn't do any pickled peppers this year not that I don't like them. We just don't eat a whole bunch of them. So if I were to take the time to grow a bunch of pepperoncinis for pickling and then can that, I just don't think, I think that would be more of a waste of my time instead of preserving uh, more of a food that we actually do eat, like growing more corn or growing more squash. We don't eat a whole lot of pickled peppers and frankly it's just like a topping on something you don't just grab a jar of pickled peppers and start eating some some of you may do that <laughs> we don't do that here in this household so i just uh, um and i couldn't find any other use for them besides uh, just throwing them in eggs or something they have sort of a tangier flavor than like using a banana pepper or something in place of a bell pepper because that's what i do i use banana peppers in place of bell peppers because bell peppers take way too long to come to maturity and, and they're kind of a waste of space in my garden. But I have a ton of ripe pepperoncinis on my plant that I just don't use because I don't enjoy the flavor of them raw and I don't really feel like preserving them. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be growing that again next year unless I get some terrible urge or request from the family to can a bunch of pickled peppers which I don't think is going to happen so I don't think I'll waste space in my garden for that one again the rest of my peppers are great um I didn't have great luck with the reaper pepper this year I had terrible germination on it um out of I had to have started the entire packet of seeds I'm not even joking and I got one plant to fruition and it's still growing and it still has not set any fruit the entire summer. So I do want to try that again just because Chase really wants a reaper pepper. Uh, but other than that, the rest of my peppers have done swimmingly. 
it's been great. I have no complaints about the rest of my peppers or any of my other tomato varieties. In fact, the Estiva tomato from Johnny Seeds was one of my favorite tomatoes to grow this year. Uh, so I definitely will be doing that again, as well as the Grand Marshal. I just need to find a better way to uh, trellis that <laughs> tomato. Um, the Giant Crimson performed beautifully. This huge tomato plant I have going on here, that is a Giant Crimson that looks, I mean, it's starting to look kind of sickly now, but uh, it made it through the summer, no problems. It's still putting off fruit. It looks great and it's huge. So I'm absolutely saving seeds from this plant as well as I'll just grow seeds from the packet that I have left next year. Um, but other than that, I don't really have any complaints about any other plants. I do want to start less basil next year because I have like seven plants scattered around <laughs> in these garden beds and I probably only ever pick basil from like one of them. I definitely don't need seven and they get so large in the middle of the summer that it just kind of makes me wonder what food producing crops could I have grown in the place of that basil because <laughs> I, I just don't use that much basil. I make a lot of fresh basil tea. I'll dehydrate some although basil doesn't dehydrate that well. It's better freeze dried and I don't have a freeze dryer. Um, but I make a lot of fresh basil tea and then over the winter, like last year in my hydroponics garden in the house, I grew basil. So I have the ability to have it year round. I don't really need seven plants. <laughs> that seems unnecessary. In regards to beans, I had excellent, still having excellent production with my asparagus beans. I will continue to grow them every year for fresh green bean eating. But I don't think I'm going to be putting the pink eye purple hole cow peas on a trellis again. Although they did climb quite a bit up a trellis, I was only able to get maybe, you know, 10 plants on each side of the trellis. And once those beans have dried, because I want to use them as dried beans, black eyed peas, uh, there, were, there weren't that many. I got about enough beans to just provide myself seed for next year. I think that if I want to be growing dried beans for storage in earnest, that I'm going to have to do it in the in-ground garden where I can have a ton of plants. Because once these plants go to seed and the seed pods dry up and you can harvest the dried beans, they're done for the most part, they may throw out a couple more bean pods, but for the most part, that's signal to the plant that it is done producing. So it's not like a green bean where you come along and you prick it fresh and the plant is constantly trying to keep producing seeds so you keep getting more green beans. For dried beans, you're basically letting this plant go to maturity and then it's just going to die. And having a one by four space for beans is not nowhere near enough space to harvest a significant amount of dried beans. With the, with the total amount I got off these plants, it had to have been like a handful. I could have made like one soup with it. One soup. <laughs> so I, I don't know what I'm going to put in this middle trellis next year, but it definitely will not be a dried bean version. I might do more asparagus beans in there. I'm kind of leaning towards trying to go to the um, red asparagus bean. It's also called the Chinese noodle bean or um, uh, yard long bean. These green ones blend in with the vines <laughs> way too well. So I have a tendency to miss a lot of these as they come, as they like go past their point where I would want to eat them fresh. So I'm thinking about getting the red versions because that has got to be more standout-ish off of the vine. And hopefully I won't miss so many green beans because I just, they look like the stems. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna try, I'm gonna order a packet of the red ones next year because I haven't had the red ones before. Um, but that's about it. I will not be trying the rattlesnake pole beans again. This was my second year. It was the second year that they failed because of the heat and that's it. You get two chances with me and then you're out. 
I'm very pleased with both of the ochre varieties I tried this year. In the past, I've done Texas Hill Country. Um, I did not try that this year. I did the Clemson Spineless and the Burgundy Red Okra. Um, I find that the Clemson Spineless stays um, softer, longer, at a larger size than the Burgundy Red. They both taste fine. They both taste like okra. <laughs> uh, but if I miss a pod or two one day and come back and it ends up being larger, the Clemson Spineless, I feel like it's edible longer than the... Um, burgundy red, which is fine. Either one is fine. I'm I'm not going to not grow the burgundy red because of that. I love the color. It's a beautiful plant and it's a beautiful ochre pod. I just need to stay on the harvesting. <laughs> you gotta check those every day. But I'm done harvesting for the afternoon. It's warm. I've got quite a bit of peppers in my basket. And now I have to organize them all. It should be fairly easy. I think I'm getting pretty good at it. <laughs> and I only picked a few banana peppers. And the only thing I get confused are like the unripe red chilies versus the ripe banana peppers. Usually I'll just take a bite and find out. <laughs> but thanks for hanging out on this long talk today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, leave them down below. I can always address them in the video or, or respond in the comments. I try and respond to every single comment I get. And, yeah, I'll catch you on the next one. It's hot. <laughs>